Christine Lagarde, direktorica mednarodnega denarnega sklada na vprašanje, ali jo kaj teži trpljenje grških državljanov. Ne. Pomislim na majhne otroke iz šole v majhni vasici v Nigru, ki so deležni dveh ur po uka na dan, ki si po trije delijo en stov in ki si srčno želijo iz obrazve. Ne prestano mislim na njih, ker menim, da potrebujejo še več pomoči kot ljudje v Atenah. In kako naj se Grki poberejo iz krize? Tako, da plačajo davke. Kaj pa, volitve? Nekdo je nekoč rekel, da če ljudstvo ni zadovoljno z vlado, je treba pač zamenjati ljudstvo. 16-letnik Delovsko-Pankarske univerze. Letošnja tema – dvojna kriza evrointegracij. Subprime crisis, which is a crisis in the 
not a very <coughs> real estate market. So it's financial, general financial crisis, which Lehman Brothers has seen as a turning point, perhaps not a turning point, but an illustrative uh, event to crisis of public budgets, sort of debt. This is a very famous quotation uh, from Walter Badger, political and economic commentator in Britain in the 19th century, and taken from Charles Kindleberg's book, which is now back in fashion. Uh, Kindleberg's book is back in fashion because it's titled it's Manias, Panics, and Crashes. Milton 
Friedman would be an antimonian <laughs> solution, uh, suggestion. <laughs> this is Hyman Minsky. Okay. Hyman Minsky, uh, American economist and the author of uh, The Financial St Instability Hypothesis as a concept, but also a famous book called Stabilizing an Unstable Economy. And like Kindleberger, this guy has to be recognized as being very prescient because he wrote about the financial instability of the United States in the 1960s. By comparison of what happened subsequently, the United States was a model of financial stability in the 1960s. We had a few bank failures, but not much else. They didn't even have a decent stock market crash until 74. Uh, okay. Minsky's view, uh, so ultra Keynesian, or heavily influenced by Keynes anyway, was that the cause of uh, financial instability was financial stability itself. In other words, uh, financial systems are inherently unstable. This is his argument. The longer if you have a long period where nothing goes wrong, then basically the financial structure becomes more and more. He, he himself used fragile. <clears throat> that was a general idea. He's now, when I read these Pekendelberger and especially Minsky uh, back in the 70s, it's because I was a leftist, you know. Uh, now he's very fashionable. He's, he's referred to in the Bank of England quarterly bulletin and stuff. You know. I resent that really because, you know, we found him first. Uh, but, Clever. No, he himself was not that, just a bit of the right kind of a guy. So with stability, more and more assets seem to be safe. Because you can easily turn them into money. They're liquid at predictable prices. That's what you mean by saying an asset is a liquid asset. You turn it into cash without too much trouble and at a price that you can anticipate. Therefore, you're happy to purchase such assets. But the more assets you purchase, the more fragile the system becomes. Leverage. Uh, this is quite important, uh, really from the point of view of employees. Uh, if interest rates are low, that should be good for employees. If capital is cheap, labor should be dear. It's an interesting question to ask why that hasn't been the case recently. Because capital has been dirt cheap. It's free almost. Uh, if you can put up any kind of collateral, you could borrow at interest rates which are below the rate of inflation and pay back less in real value than you borrowed. So when capital, when capital is so cheap, why is labor not rich? Why are wages not high? Uh, and, 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 I think some of the reasons are to be found in the, in the financial sector. Okay. No interest rates for straight wealth holders. They don't like them, obviously. Um, but they also give a possibility or an apparent possibility of escape from the same problem because they make it easy to leverage your position. So if you can find an exceptional asset, an asset which has a higher yield than usual, you can borrow and buy enormous quantities of such an asset. So those are, that's real long-term interest rates in the UK and the US. This is um, <coughs> drastic uh, decline. And people with lots of money don't like interest rates being 1% or they, they don't like it being zero. Uh, but what they will tend to do, or what enough of them will tend to do under some circumstances, is, is use a low interest rate to borrow money and try and find some asset which promises a high return. There's, a, there's a, the arithmetic of leverage. Uh, this has to be explained to uh, British students because they don't do arithmetic in Britain anymore. But I'm going to assume that it's the meaning everybody can count, so we'll skip over that. Basically, you can, if you uh, if you leave in your position, you can you 
can uh, get a much higher rate, rate of return on your capital. Because, because you're using your ammunition, somebody else's ammunition. Uh, so all of it, unfortunately, uh, works in reverse. If uh, you borrow a lot of money to buy a potentially high yielding asset and its price declines, then uh, you, you can very seriously be in trouble. So if conditions remain stable, this is Minsky, basically, there will be more and more leverage, and more and more speculative positions will be adopted, more and more investors will be endangered by fallen asset values or rising interest rates. So the more levered, the more stable the system, the more likely it is people will borrow and, and, and buy, uh, try to buy high yielding assets because it's a stable system, nobody's losing any money. Uh, but as they do so, more and more leveraged positions are adopted and more and more investors, wealth holders, are exposed to rising interest rates. It's going to hurt them or decline in asset values. And now I think we have to look at what, you, what thing you speculate in. This is just one of my favorite movies because uh, Fennel Ray is uh, desperately in love uh, with, a, with, a, with a woman who's, who's portrayed by two completely different actresses uh, uh, who actually look quite different. He can't, he can't tell the difference. So he, he knows he's fantastically attracted to, uh, to shall we say, an asset, uh, uh, but he can't really tell exactly what it is. So these are some of the objects of desire, uh, obscure objects of desire, as well put it. Uh, Japanese shares and real estate, Russian currency and government bonds, East Asia, the tigers, the dragons, high tech, uh, with the big Nasdaq crash. 2001. Finally, subprime. Now, subprime is uh, different, and here I'll make a basic point about uh, globalization and the global economy that you have to think all the time about the scale. About the scale. And I don't think you could have had a crash of the scale that we experienced in 2008, except in North American real estate. The reason being that all other objects of desire are just too small. Um, you, you start to buy high-tech shares, and now there were people in America who specialized in issuing high-tech high shares. They'd set up a website that was uh, going to be their, their high-tech uh, project, an enterprise, and they'd issue shares. And people would buy those shares hungrily. But even with everybody, every uh, college graduate in California doing that, they still couldn't produce enough shares quickly enough to make it a serious object of speculation. The thing blew up in 18 months. Yeah. And, and the, 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 the belief spread, especially in central banks and among regulators, that, well, financial instability is not such a big problem. We have a bubble, it bursts, we push some more money, cut interest rates, push some more money into the system, everything's hunky-dory again, we take off, we have another bubble, we move forward from bubble to bubble, no problem. North American real estate is different because it's big. Just as the American economy is big, you, you know, if I look up the OECD statistics, it will say, you know, United States, and then it will say some Slovenia, yeah. as if we're talking about two examples of the same thing, which is, which is such manifest nonsense, isn't it? It's just manifest nonsense. Uh, okay. So subprime was big, and therefore subprime could go on involving and pulling in, absorbing uh, money for a long time before it became clear to everybody that this was a bubble. Except those who uh, produced it in new money, right? 
I doubt that even they understood what they were doing. Really? <coughs> they understood they were on a good thing, and they understood <laughs> that the mortgages they were selling weren't worth what they were getting for them. Yeah? Why wouldn't you sell a mortgage if you thought it was really valuable? But also the instrument they devised out of it, you know, they defended against it. Yeah. Oh, the, the instruments were extremely clever. <laughs> but the, the, the people who suffered when those instruments failed were largely the people who invented them. They didn't sell enough of them. And, uh, one, this, this is a, to answer the question, one of, one of the problems when things went wrong was a lot of these assets were actually held by the banks. They weren't on the bank's books, but they were held by the banks, and the banks had to take them back onto the books uh, to, to guarantee their investors against loss. Okay, so this... Uh, here we have uh, total U.S. finance, and half of it is mortgages. So this is $15 trillion, and you could throw money in there for a decade, and it was essentially more than a decade before people started to see that things were going. Okay, so the, the subprime crisis then spread to the banks and interbank inter loans, the cutoff interbank loans are very, very important because the bank's strategy for 30 years now has been to accelerate the, the circulation of cash, not to, not to have more bank deposits, but to circulate them very, very fast, right? unbelievably fast. Scale and speed are two aspects of globalization. Uh, various bailouts of, of impaired <coughs> finance houses and banks were organized up until the autumn of 2008 when Lehman Brothers was allowed to go bust in an investment bank in New York City and that created generalized panic. Subprime uh, costs that meant that, that some banks had been impaired, nobody knew which banks had been impaired and therefore the bank market collapsed. This is the uh, information asymmetry problem. You know that somebody, one of your counterparties is broke, but you don't know which counterparty it is, therefore you don't trade with any of them. Okay, this is, that's the instrument that was referred to. This is, uh, I won't go into the details. How 80% uh, of this stuff could be declared AAA, as to say as good as Uncle Sam, and then you could take 88% of the rest and say that that was uh, AAA as well. Uh, it was amazing kind of uh, conceptual developments. Okay. And then from the banks to the economy as a whole, uh, private sector deleverages because it's uh, lost wealth, and it's scared of financial instability, you pay down your there's only one way you could uh, get out of debt, and that, that's to spend less than your income. <coughs> Reduce your indebtedness. And government responds uh, in the correct way uh, by fighting recession and recapitalizing banks. This is uh, the British cartoonist Steve Bell, and the, the fat cats there are the banks, and they're getting blood transfusions from the little people. Gordon Brown was in charge. <coughs> the, other, uh, the other figure was, is Mervyn King, still briefly to be uh, governor of the Bank of England. Okay, now a couple of points. I haven't got slides to show about this. Uh, the, com the complicity of the European Union and these developments, you think they're American developments, it's global investors going crazy in New York City. The implication, that it, the complicity of, of uh, the Euro Europeans and the European Union. The European banks had bigger exposures to subprime than the American banks. They were more leveraged. The leverage ratio in typical American banks prior to the crisis might have been 25 or 30. In, in for large European banks it was 40. Yeah. That is 40% of their assets were financed, sorry, 39 40ths of their assets were financed by <coughs> borrowing. 
if you're in that situation, a decline in the value of your assets by one fortieth renders you insolvent, which came close to happening, uh, and did happen, in fact, uh, had it not been for the emergency, the emergency blood aid from the little people. Okay, so the complicity of the EU. So that's as regards the banks, but also as regards deregulation. The, the whole uh, Lisbon strategy, as it was called, uh, Lisbon agenda, which which was the agenda of the EU from uh, 2000 to 2010, was based on financial deregulation. So financial deregulation was a central feature. And the Stockholm Council, they said, we want to make Europe the easiest and cheapest place to do business in the world. The transactions costs, lower transactions costs, that's all you need to do, uh, and you'll get a modern financial sector. The modern financial sector, and that means an Americanized financial sector, will give you an efficient economy. That was thinking, you can find it in all these documents, though they don't get cited as often as they used to. And something I've mentioned to, to Primoz today, that also they were going for subprime. Uh, the white paper on mortgage finance issued by the Director General for Economic and Financial Affairs, that's DG Internal Market, uh, 2005, was going straight for subprime. They were going to abolish all the housing regimes and mortgage regimes in, in, uh, in the member states, however many there were at that time, 20 odd. Those, and replace them with a European system which would give people choice. And choice is going to be very beneficial to the citizens because you could choose to take out a mortgage that you have absolutely no hope to be paying. <coughs> so that's really lots of choice. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I challenged them on that. I had the opportunity to speak at the, the uh, European. Uh, Social Committee, Economic and Social Committee in, in uh, 2007. I didn't know what was going on in the States, but I knew what was going on in Europe. It was disastrous. And I said it was hooliganism. Uh, but they said they were defending the citizen. That's bad. They were defending. They were, so that, that project disappeared in the white paper of December 2007. And, uh, if you really like spending lots of time on a computer, try and find those documents on the Commission's website. You'll be clicking for a long time before you find them buried in the archive. What is your policy on mortgages? What are you talking about? Uh, so the Europeans encouraged this. And then another the final aspect of this, which will sort of take us on to the Eurozone crisis, uh, is that. What happened in the Eurozone reflected the general financial conditions in this bu bubble and its crisis. And, uh, so that's to say, finance was very, very easy uh, for, for the weaker economies and the weaker economies and the less competitive economies of the Eurozone right up to the crisis. And then suddenly finance disappeared. Could borrow money or love. Okay, what's, what's counteracting the crisis? Of the, you know, you've got a crisis of the public sector debt, firstly because the private sector is not spending any money, so the government has to spend some money or cut some taxes to try and get some expenditure and economic activity and employment in the economy. Secondly, because you have insolvent banks you have to rescue. And you, have to, you do that by recapitalizing on an expensive business. So, it's easy to see the crisis of public sector debt. However, in Britain and the United States, we have sovereign, uh, we have sovereignty, and we we have uh, central banks which will keep interest rates low when the government needs to borrow. In fact, the British government is borrowing for nothing, borrowing for slightly less than nothing, and uh, and the American government likewise. <clears throat> that makes it possible for them, uh, firstly, to to uh, takes the pressure of, of indebtedness off. If 
you don't have to service a debt, it's not, it's not too significant, and it allows them to moderate their reductions in expenditure. Uh, why can you still keep interest rates low? Because investors are scared. They're very, they're very, very frightened investors. And at the moment, there's a lot of people with money who would rather keep that money in the bank and see it gradually eroded by inflation than risk it in any kind of uh, um, enterprise. They're so scared they are. They're more scared than I've known them in my lifetime. They don't have anywhere else to go. It's called liquidity preference. But in the Eurozone, monetary finance and government ruled out by mandate of the ECB. <clears throat> why? Because the ECB is there to fight inflation, which is why the generals in 1939 had all prepared for trench warfare. Uh, so, uh, That, this is the actual document, the actual clause. Overdrafts or any other type of credit facility with the European Central Bank or with the national central banks in favor of union institutions, bodies, offices or agencies, central governments, regional, local or other public authorities, other bodies governed by public law, public undertakings, member states shall be prohibited. As shall the purchase directly from them by the European Central Bank or national central banks of debt instruments. That's a pretty comprehensive uh, and Jens Feidman, head of the Bundesbank, says, well, we can't break the law. Actually, you need to break the law. This law is insane. You know? uh, if, we, if they had this law in the United States now, uh, we, we, we'd be in the second 1930s. But that's the law. And somebody with a tidy mind wrote that. Uh, and it, it, it's put governments in the weaker economies right on the rack. Okay, there are imbalances in the uh, Eurozone. Uh, these are the surplus and deficits in terms of uh, in terms of uh, current account trade and, and trade. Well, the current account, which is slightly different from trade, but more or less the same thing. Most, all countries except Ireland. And uh, what you see is huge surpluses in Germany. In, in the, the German, although the, the Dutch ones are bigger, the German ones are, of course, much more significant because it's a much, much bigger economy. And there are one or two other of the usual suspects I could have added to that table, such as Finland. <clears throat> and the weaker economies, these four would now be called the periphery. And, uh, much, 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 very, very big uh, deficits. The, the 14.7 figure is, is staggering, really. So this is an economy which consumed 14% more than it produced. It's, it's quite, a, quite an achievement. <laughs> now, that only, only in uh, 2007, but it was pretty close to it. So I, I, I brought those up to date. The, the situation is, is better, but you know, not massively better. The 5.7% figure for Germany, by the way, is compatible with European Union norms. The scoreboard, I'll show you, I'll show you in a while on the scoreboard. Okay. Uh, Spain and Portugal have narrowed the deficits a little, so, so the this is still very, very highly imbalanced. So these imbalances developed. And I, I think the, the question is really the question that they were based on, related to uh, those imbalances in trade were to some extent uh, <coughs> consequences of, of different evolution of wages. There's a normal unit labor costs, but since all these countries are using euros, then uh, it doesn't matter that they're, they're nominal, that they're not corrected for inflation. What you see is... Uh, the Eurozone's target was to have inflation of roughly 2% a year. It's like up close to under 2% is the expression they use. And you see the Eurozone achieved this. Uh, uh, labor costs per unit output went up roughly by 2% a year. Uh, labor costs.
costs are the main costs of anything they produce. But in Germany, they, did, they undershot massively. You know, this is a huge pressure, downward pressure on German wages. Uh, year after year, sometimes uh, not even getting compensation for inflation, but never getting compensation for productivity. And that created the imbalance. That, that's a major factor behind that, the current account imbalances. Okay. So the periphery is broke, or at least illiquid. But they have huge public sector deficits. They can't any longer attract the capital inflows very easily. Uh, the private sector is trying to deleverage and doesn't want to buy suspect assets uh, such as Greek paper or Spanish paper. I've got the, some of the figures on the actual public sector debts and, and deficits. I think uh, it's it, it's. Uh, widely thought that, that the situation in Greece is uh, the most severe uh, with the 162% public debt. That's a couple of years ago, but <clears throat> the target uh, that the Troika have set for Greece is to get it down to 120% by 2020. And they're not on target to do that. So, so uh, to stop it, so this is the Greek situation is exceptional. Uh, I think the quite widely held view, held view for the other countries in trouble is that with an expansionary fiscal policy and accommodating monetary policy, they'd be okay. That is to say, if they were able to operate roughly the same policies as are being pursued in the United States, they'd be okay. And the debt would not have to go mounting up, partly because be servicing it for free, the interest rates would be tiny. Greece might be a different situation. Okay. Uh, two ways out. Uh, firstly, the EU takes over the debt, and this is the notion of Eurobonds and of the European Financial <coughs> Stability Facility, uh, which is to partly Europeanizing the debt. The trouble with those two solutions is Eurobonds are simply quite coldly refused by Northern European countries and Germany in particular. And the EFSF has only been given uh, 500 million. A successor is called the European Stability Fund. I can't remember. There's a successor institution now. But, but it's only the EFSF is, hasn't got the kind of scale that's required. It's alternative, and it's an alternative to which the European Central Bank has increasingly been resorted simply to cover all the problems with lots of lovely cash. And, uh, so this is Paul de Grau, who's a Belgian economist. He's actually a senator in Belgium. Imagine an army going to war. It has overwhelming firepower. The generals, however, announce that they actually hate the whole thing and that they will limit the shooting as much as possible. Some of the generals are so upset by the, we're thinking of the Buddhist bank here, by the prospect of going to war that they resign from the army. The remaining generals then tell the enemy that the shooting will only be temporary, and that the army will go home as soon as possible. Uh, uh, then Paul de Grau does what I, I think is completely unnecessary. Then. Uh, explains what the metaphor is. So I'm not going to insult you with that. So, uh, so the situation's changed. Don't say no production. I've gone into this. i got a new slide. Okay. Uh, uh, my second topic I've come to is what, 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 that's only the first topic. Uh, my main point is the complicity of the European Union in the um, in the uh, financial crash and its consequences. And since they're complicit, they should take responsibility. Uh, the response is the uh, is that what I call the surveillance union, 
I'll do this quickly because I, I don't want to go on too long. Okay, so uh, the six pack, the two pack, the fact for the euro, the fiscal compact. There's some other terms of art you have to learn if you want to do this stuff. The European semester. The European semester is the first half of the year. The national semester only begins July the 1st. Yeah? So and that applies no doubt to the uh, Slovenia semester. We have the European semester after two. And then hardly in the second half of the year do we have the national semester. And there's a score scorecard. And what is all this doing? It's a kind of... Uh, it's uh, Bentham's dream of, do you know the notion of a panopticon? Where you, you so organize the, the prison that, that one guard in the center can survey every cell and, and, and watch what everybody's doing. We see what the Greeks are doing, we can see what the Slovenians are doing, and yeah, it's all fantastic. It's control. It's control freakery. And some, some of the language is amazing. I'm not going to go into the details, really. Uh, there's a... There's a semesters, the first time of the European semester. The six-pack, stronger surveillance, reinforced penalties, you get the idea. Then uh, you could not just have uh, ex excessive uh, debts, public debts, you can have excessive imbalances, because they learned from experience uh, that Ireland, for example, didn't have government, government borrowing until the crisis. They had a surplus. Spain did not have government borrowing and a surplus, public sector surplus. Germany never had a public sector surplus, but the Spaniards did. So did the Irish, quite substantial ones, minus a tenth of a pint of GDP. So we have to lock that at stable door, uh, because that was bolted as well. Uh, and it's more and more control and control and control and uh, automaticity, and nobody has any discretion. And we have to be able to look at uh, the latest thing is in the two pack is we get to look at your budget. So Slovenia has to show, Slovenian authorities have to show their budget to the commission before they show it to the Slovenian parliament. It's the law. You know? that's, well, they're trying to make it the law. Hopefully, that was the fault, but that's the, that's the idea. And, and uh, although the national parliament remains sovereign, how can it be sovereign if they're only told about it after the European Commission? Uh, the uh, commission can require changes, and if we've actually taken the money, <coughs> We're in a bailout situation. It's not this annual surveillance. It's uh, it's every three months. In fact, they're more or less there all the time. They never go away. No. You've got you've got the trico officials swarming all over your, your public offices all the time. These are the scoreboard, and uh, it's, it, it's it's like Kafka in that it's sinister. But it's also ridiculous. It's deeply, deeply comic, and uh, they they think they can have a legislative, a, a juridical framework for macroeconomics. Have any of you ever studied macroeconomics? You think you can have a juridical framework? You say, oh, well, we're very worried about your net international investment position. Uh, we're going to find you. We're going to find you. We're going to uh, uh, change in export market share. Most of these indicators uh, concern competitiveness. And this is a drive to enforce competitiveness in the weaker economies. Changes in house prices, you see another, another house prices are completely flat in the European Union, but that's another stable door being bolted. Uh, this is a distressing uh, situation. I've got some more on the scoreboard. It is, they do have the unemployment rate in there. That's fantastic. If your unemployment rate is over 10% in three years, there may be something wrong with your economy. <laughs> Maybe we'll find you. That would help with it. Uh, but notice the uh, the uh, it's, it's in the previous one. The, the current account balance here, the first one, the percent of GDP. There are two. There are two uh, thresholds. If you're in deficit, the figure is four percent, no more than four percent. If you're in surplus, it's six percent. Do you remember Germany's surplus? Five point seven five. Neo-mercantilist rules. Okay. <coughs> okay. So, if you look at the, uh, so I, I could go into the details of the surveillance union, uh, and uh, but there's, I haven't got the time, and uh, I just give you, you know, if you you can read these documents, they're on the internal market website and uh, the, the, the strange. Uh, 
an excessive imbalanced procedure. Your economy is excessively imbalanced, therefore we are litigating against you. We're taking the court of justice with a view to finding you, your population, to help you, uh, to encourage the others. Encourage the others. <clears throat> okay, that, a, a risk of poverty and social exclusion uh, this, this, this indicator is itself uh, completely problematized by the crisis because it's based on uh, median income. Uh, and median income has collapsed. So poor people have more, a bigger share, a bigger proportion of median income than they used to in a lot of countries. So therefore, they're not, they're not as poor as they used to be. So, but this is the typical indicator. Just see what the usual suspects are, all the ones over on the right, Bulgaria, Romania, Latvia, Hungary, Lithuania, Poland, Greece, Ireland, Portugal, Italy, I think it's uh, Estonia. Yeah. So, uh, Spain, Estonia and then Spain. So, uh, all, all of the bad pupils have uh, poverty problems. What, what, what's happening is not designed to alleviate those problems. Uh, okay, just to say something quickly about social Europe. Uh, it's a kind of deterioration even though of the whole history of the uh, of European integration. The, the first step in European integration was the Schumann Plan. And they introduced a social fund uh, that is called the Steel Community, set up in '52. Introduced a social fund. And the function of the fund was to compensate those who lost from eco economic integration. And that's exactly what it did. If you lost out from economic integration, the, the European institutions, authorities compensated you. Mostly, these were Belgian coal miners. Job. <coughs> Belgian coal wasn't very competitive. But that's what it did. So at that time, this was a sovereign arrangement and had strong, strong, strong social policy. Only for that sector, coal and steel. And what you have since then is firstly, there was a more rough equality between social and economic policy. Then social policy tended to take a bit of a back seat. In the last decade, you've had really aggressive moves against the national social models. In, in, to enforce the single market and the competition rules. Uh, the, the two that are worth mentioning are the Bolkestein Directive, which was a comprehensive deregulation of services and service sector employment, and uh, the recent decisions of the European Court of Justice as regards posted workers, that's to say workers working temporarily in another country. The ECJ has undermined the status of these workers quite comprehensively in recent judgments. So now, uh, but then to cap the climax, what you have, of course, is the Troika. So if you actually, it's bad enough if you're just a weak economy, uh, you, have, you have to have produce your stability plan, you have to have produce your national reform program, you have to have it surveyed, you have to show your budget documents, you have to have commission people coming and looking at the statistical agencies, at, at your uh, treasury civil servants, and they're looking at your, uh, your uh, wage bargaining policies, etc. But once you borrow money, they have the power of creditors as well as the power of the European Union, of European legislation. Demand policy changes and structural reforms. Now, structural reforms, anybody interested in international development will know is something in which pretty comprehensively failed. It's a World Bank strategy and an IMF strategy in the 1980s and 1990s. So we're talking here as so often about something which has failed and we continue with it and keep it going. Peter. An independent review has been undertaken of the continued relevance, fairness and efficiency of statutory wage setting mechanisms covering the range of low paid sectors. We're going to find low paid workers and we're going to reduce their wages. This is going to make Ireland more competitive. 
an action plan. The language, the Aesopian language, is, as Leonard put it, is dreadful. Uh, if you see uh, the word incentive, you can assume it means welfare, benefit cuts, and so on. It's, uh, if you see pension reform, it means privatization, and so on. So you have to know the code to understand what these people are talking about. Okay, the worst by far is the Memorandum of Understanding with Greece. And uh, I don't use that word lightly. So this is how the language ones, this is just the first paragraph. I just took it random. Run. Reduction in pharmaceutical expenditure by at least 1,076. How did they get that 76 million, not 75 million? No. In 2012, by reducing medicine prices, generics and brand medicine co-payments, reducing pharmacists and wholesalers' trade margins, and applications of compulsory e-prescription by active substance protocols. The update, da, 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 so, this is this is what the Troika is saying. You know, this is people from the IMF saying this is what you're going to have to do. Some more. By the way, there is some irony here because the big German pharmaceutical companies can't sell into Greece anymore. They don't. They don't have any money to buy drugs. Reduction in the number of deputy mayors and associated staff. So we think your country has got too many deputy mayors. What are they doing all day? How much money are you giving these people? It's, it's astonishing the precision, uh, at least of the language, 270 million front load income. Re residents in remote areas must no longer be subsidized. You know, the Greece is a very mountainous uh, and uh, full of islands. And you're not allowed to help people live in remote places anymore. Uh, so the implications for social Europe uh, I'm going to conclude with. Okay. So I'm going, to, I'm going to finish now because I said an hour and I'm slightly over. I'm going to finish. Okay, so topics four and five I'm just going to deal with quite quickly. What are the key immediate issues? And here I'm just going by uh, a column by Wolfgang Munchau, who's the Eurozone correspondent for the Financial Times. If you're interested in this stuff and what's happening, that is the indispensable source. You have to read Munchau every week and see what's going on. Uh, and he had a <coughs> lovely column two weeks ago. Five problems that are very important in the Eurozone. And that's a great five problems that are very important. For example, he didn't think Frank, the French economy was in terribly bad trouble. He didn't think competitiveness differentials were, were too serious because they were narrowing and so on. So there were three key problems. One, uh, not, nothing has been done about the indebtedness of some countries which can't pay, certainly Greece, probably Ireland as well. They can't pay. And nothing has been done to put them in a situation where they're solvent. So, and that just hanging over the situation. Now, seems to be the, the case that nothing will be done until the German elections. I think we should in the autumn of 2013. Nothing will be done until then because, <clears throat> although there will be debt forgiveness, Angela doesn't want to say debt forgiveness to the voters until it's after the election. And then she'll get maybe some like-minded people in the Social Democratic Party and they say, well, you know, really that money's gone. We're not going to get it back. So I recognize that fact. So that, that problem has not been uh, solved. It's been, as they say, kicked down the road. Secondly, the macro stance remains massively dysfunctional. And here the key evidence is a recent paper from the IMF. And what they did was calculate the multiplier for uh, changes in fiscal policy. Uh, and they reckoned that multiplier was much higher than previously been the case, and that it might be approaching 2%, meaning that if you tighten government budget by 1% of GDP, GDP falls by 2%. And that was a figure which surprised even people who have been very critical, but that is close to 1% or round about in excess of 1% seems to be obvious, simply from experience. So this huge fiscal squeeze, these enormous cuts, these big tax hikes have actually uh, driven the uh, economy down. I'll show you one slide about this. I've got it somewhere. Yeah, that's, that's uh, 
up, up on the, the, this top, uh, top corner there is the target for the uh, 2020 program. And, uh, and the reality is not uh, marvelous. And that's actually in the National Reform Program. Maybe it's a, um, it's a Greek ironist. <laughs> anyway, nothing has been done to stop austerity. The pressures for austerity are still very, very tight. I think they're easing off a little bit because they've realized what a big mistake massive austerity has been. If you <clears throat> it, was, it was really fascinating. Uh, 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 towards the end of last year, a new set. Yeah, it, your, towards the end of 2011, a new set of forecasts came out. Economic forecasts came out from the Commission, and they said, uh, without exception, our forecasts have proved to be too optimistic. This suggests that some common factor is at work. <laughs> they've, been, they've imposed a general fiscal drive for massive fiscal consolidation throughout 27 nations, and then they said there might be a common factor. <laughs> it's, it's, nothing has been done about that. It needs, it needs to stop. No. And, and finally, uh, this, this is uh, Mojo's list of three, the banking union. There's a kind of vicious cycle where, the, 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 let's say, the Greek banks are holding Greek government paper, yeah. and the government can't pay, and that puts the banks in trouble, but then the, the government has to come to try and rescue the banks, somehow or other, which puts the government in worse trouble, which makes the debt even more toxic, and you have that kind of <clears throat> And, and, and uh, the idea of a banking union was really an attempt to deal with that, and that is not in place. We have a date, which is uh, January 2013, but we don't have uh, we don't have any of the rules or institutions that would really resolve this problem of, of uh, what it meant to say is that in the future small countries can't have big banks, so you can't have a global bank based in Ljubljana because we're right. in bust. You guys would have to come up with the money. There isn't enough of you to come up with that kind of money. Yeah? So, or Iceland, really. Yeah, yeah, well, Iceland, they refuse to pay. But of course, Iceland is not subject to the Troika. It's not subject to the European Commission. It's not subject to the European Central Bank. It has its own nice central bank, which proves it comes lots of lovely area. Okay. So those are key issues for the year of the Eurozone. So our final remark, really, uh, I'll just, what they say, cut to the chase. So. Uh, I'm hoping that <coughs> if, he, if he comes to office, I was interested to see that Syriza have ceased to be a coalition of becoming a single party. And presumably the reason is that uh, there was some doubt about whether in the Greek, in the Greek parliament they have a winner-takes-all uh, system so that the party which gets the most votes gets 50 extra representatives. Uh, it's supposed to be favourite stability. And Syriza expects to be the party that gets the most votes next time, but the, the people, constitutional lawyers, particularly conservative constitutional lawyers, will say, oh, hold on, you're not a party, you're a coalition, so you don't get 50 extra seats, so you have an absolute nightmare on trying to go on the country. But I noticed that they, they're ceasing to be a coalition, becoming a party, presumably for that reason, because uh, like Greek leftists, they like factionalism and dispute. Love it. So good luck to me, way to Syriza. Uh, of course, we have uh, some problems in the United States too. The other side of the pond, as we say in England, uh, the fiscal cliff. If, if, if the United States goes over that cliff, there's a serious, going to be serious problems for the European economy. I had a note on the Baltic Republics uh, and. Uh, Basically, the situation in the Baltic Republic is not good. This is Latvian immigration into my own little country. So we said quite a lot, hello to quite a lot of Latvians since the since crisis. Okay, uh, so my conclusion on social policy, and it concerns the social deficit, the democratic deficit, 
the absence of any political control over the ECB and the domination of European committees and uh, comitology in general by uh, big corporations. It's scarcely an exaggeration to say social dumping has become the actual social strategy of the European Union as the drive to restore competitiveness, that is to reduce labour costs by any means available, has become the central component of a dogmatic, aggressive and dysfunctional response to the crisis of public debt. Christ itself largely attributable to the myopia and pusillanimity of European Union and Northern European leaderships. Thank you for your attention. discussions and 
parliamentary elections, European parliamentary elections. No, I do not. I used to hope that those rational forces with strong European civil society could bring about a reorientation, a redirection of European policy. I don't think those forces are strong enough. What's going to change European policies revolt? People are going to have to disobey. And they, they, this happened in Britain a couple of years ago. The workers just said, we're not having so many migrants on our, on our site, on our, on our building site. And the employers, either they could, whether they, whether they go, to go to the European Court of Justice and, and, uh, and uh, prosecute each. Only, only challenge, only revolt will change the system now. Now, I, I, that's a very leftist statement. It's not, it's not something I would have endorsed up until the last year or so. But seeing what's going on now, I think, <clears throat> okay, the 27 parliaments can refuse. Any one of 27 parliaments can refuse to enact a directive. I hope one or two do. Any one of 27 judiciaries can refuse to implement European law. Any one of 27 executives can refuse to carry out the executive decisions of the Commission. If that does not happen, I do not think there can be change in the system. <coughs> then they're going to suffer, yeah? So then, because... Uh, you cannot make people pay money they don't have. The yeah. money is already lost. Slovenia didn't lose a lot of that money because it's not holding up green yeah. paper. I'm just saying that then they have to say to the taxpayers, okay, we're going to stop this program and you're going to pay for it. But no one has the courage to do but that. But the, the taxpayer is losing more by recession and austerity by far than the taxpayer is losing by an increased tax burden. It's macroeconomics. Yeah? It's, it's not, not like, you know, you ought to be prudent in your own little house. Yeah? You have to look at all the balance sheets. Yeah? The, the, we, we divide them into the foreign sector, the financial corporate sector, the other corporate sector, the household sector, and general government. Yeah? If you want to understand what's happening in the economy, you have to look at the way these five sets of balance sheets interact. For example, there's no point in driving a government back into surplus if you're driving your main corporations into loss. Yeah? So, so macroeconomics counts. There's no point in increasing taxes if the multiplier is 1.9, which the IMF says it's 1.9, because you're going to lose two points of GDP for every one point of tax. You, 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 you raise you know, in your revenue. So, uh, uh, it, this is not more. This is not. It is a deeply moral issue, but the morality is not the morality of the individual household, of the individual who should be careful uh, uh, and not go wild with the credit card. More questions, observations. I'm not too sure John's right that. You ignore debt service. It depends whether you intend to pay the debt or not. <laughs> if you intend, if it seems to be, if you intend to pay the debt, then you should consider 
the, the entire deficit and not simply the primary deficit. Yeah? But if the money is not repayable, can't be repaid, and you have no intention of going and paying it, then what matters is the primary deficit. That's the same your income and your revenue. Yeah? It's going to release the funds. And that money is not going to go to anybody in Greece. It's going to go to the holders of Greek paper. So, okay, so that, to me, this is an accounting move. You know? uh, otherwise, the Greek government will default. They're not going to let the Greek government default anytime soon. But, but I, I think that what should happen is the Greeks should default, uh, get control back of their own country. They, they would mean they would not have any external finance. They haven't got any external finance at the moment. All, the, all, the, all they're being allowed to do is, is, is borrow money to pay the interest on the debts they've already got. They can't do that without abolishing uh, the euro. Uh, yeah, okay. So, read my article in the Trotskyist Journal Solidarity two weeks ago, which is called North Korea by the Acropolis. It's a critique of uh, Kostas Lapovitsis' view that the drachma is the way out. I think no, there'll be plenty of people very, very happy to see the Greeks go back to the drachma. Jens Weidman, for what? He thinks the central bank is to obey the law. Uh, say, uh, to adapt Voltaire from time to time is necessary to kick a country out of the monetary union, <laughs> to encourage the others. Uh, so, but I think introducing that currency in a fraught economic and political situation would be a very dangerous move, and it's quite likely that the currency wouldn't be accepted, and it would need quite a lot of force to make people accept it. And that prospect that violence, quite large violence would be necessary, uh, what worries me. I don't think a simple default has the same implications. Most of the people who are going to suffer are going to be outside Greece because they're holding Greek assets, and it's an accounting thing. A piece of paper is written on your books as being worth 100 pounds, but you know it's only worth 20 pounds. You're not losing money if you if you rob out 100 pounds and write 20 pounds. You're acknowledging a fact. You know, and then they said, okay, the, so the target was that Greece should be indebted by no more than 120% by 2020, <coughs> eight years away. And there'll still be twice the norm, the European norm. How what interest rates will we, they be paying? Yeah? Let's say let's say they're paying six percent which would be an improvement as regards the market, Greece kind of borrow on the markets at all, yeah? Uh, so you'd be, be saying seven points of, of GDP have to be paid to the creditors every year. That doesn't help the Greeks, you know? It helps the creditors. I was, I'm, I'm so old. I was, at, <laughs> I was at a conference in uh, 1983 to discuss the Mexican crisis. And the person who made the, the most honest and most convincing um, this, this, well, account of the situation was a neoliberal. The guy from the Midland Bank was terrible. He says, we said, how much of this Mexican money do you want back? He said, I want 100 cents on the dollar. And he knew who he was going to get it from, the IMF. Uh, and I'll tell you, who, who, who criticized that position? Anna Schwartz, the the bosom companion and co-author of Milton Friedman. She said that money is gone, it's lost. Honestly, required that you recognize that fact. And if you, if you, if you bail out this situation, you're not bailing out the Mexican people, you're bailing out the money center banks in the United States. I didn't understand that at the time. 
know, I'm just talking for revolution and so on, but that was a, 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 an honest neoliberal just assessing the situation. <laughs> that was 20 years ago. It's not like there haven't been sovereign defaults before. It would be preferable if the European Union said, yes, we are responsible, we got you into this situation. It's there for its own debt. Uh, that would be the, the, the best situation. They were responsible, they got into the situation. They let it get faster and get worse and worse, year after year. They did nothing about it. They said that financial deregulation was okay. The bond markets were the best judges of who should uh, be lent money. No interference, no nothing. You said the bit of deregulation, and can we have subprime mortgages as soon as possible? That was their stats from 2000 to 2007, the end, the end of 2007. Therefore, there is a European responsibility on this, and I hope that more of the debt will be assumed by you. And that would be better because otherwise, the losses are concentrated on the creditors. Yeah, and there'll be some creditors which you wouldn't want to punish, such as pension funds. You don't want to have to take big losses. Uh, but but the, the debt it will have to be cancelled against some assets. You can cancel it by inflation, you can cancel it by default, you can cancel it by mutualization, or by raising the wealth tax. In various ways. I, gave, I had some figures here. I think I'm for a wealth tax to deal with some of this. Uh, <coughs> I, got, I had some figures. We put them in the Euro Memorandum last year. that the, I, 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 I haven't been able to find that quotation, but the point is that, uh, that a lot of people did very, very well out of the boom and the bubble and, and uh, have gone on, wealth, wealthy individuals, and they're defined as someone with more than a million euros of, of uh, investable assets. And uh, their total holdings in the European Union are 10 trillion euros. And that figure rose by 7% in 2009. That's to say, in the middle of the crisis, the wealthy increased their assets by 7%, where people are being, all, even in Germany, and wealthy countries like the Netherlands are being told there's no money. If you have a country which runs a balance of payment surplus for 70 years, 65 years, then that country must have assets. And uh, the problem in Germany is that not, none of those assets are in the hands of the public sector. They're all private assets held by individuals and corporations. I think some of those should be at risk in the attempt to cancel some of the debt rather than simple, simple default. A simple default is better than nothing. I'm enjoying uh, the hostile uh, question. <laughs> uh, please uh, don't uh, hesitate. You can probably throw things if you prefer. <laughs> no, um, uh, um, it's not my intention to be hostile because, you know, I'm an economist by profession. I mean, by profession, I'm doing my master's in economics, uh, economics and uh, it's really easy just to say that something doesn't work, but it's much more difficult to say what needs to be done to achieve some better position. Well, the Euro Memo, uh, Economists for an Alternative Economic Strategy, is an organization which is 18 years old. I found a member, uh, 
uh, we have tried to say every year, every single year, what would be alternatives. And we've tried to make them reasonable and moderate and have some prospect of realization. Uh, so that's 18 lances we've broken on this windmill. I think uh, it's necessary for people to criticize public policy. Because a democracy won't work unless they do. So they have to say what's wrong and what should be done. Now, I, I, I could go through, I would say, starting at the top with mutualization of the debt followed by a hefty wealth tax on the biggest corporations and the wealthiest individuals. That would be my ideal. But if I come to write down and say it would be better if the Greek government defaulted and sold off every asset in its possession, that's the bottom. That's the rock bottom. I don't want to say that. I say it because I know none of the other things further on the list are going to happen. <laughs> that uh, Francois Chenet wrote a book last year about <coughs> the question of whether debts are justified. When, when debt is, as they say, odious, it's quite an interesting uh, discussion. But as I say, debt is not something you can do alone. It requires a creditor. And those creditors have pretty obviously made big mistakes. They don't pay for their mistakes. Yeah, but this, this the, 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 the IMF rescues them from the consequences of their mistakes. The ECB rescues them. The European Commission rescues so them. So the default should happen when the debt was in private hands. That was the main problem. But now when it's in public hands? Unfortunately, the strategy has been exactly that, to take pressure off the banking system by buying their toxic paper and, uh, and refinancing the debtors to allow the debtors to clear some of the old debts by assuming new debts. And those new debts, as you say, are very often to the ECB and to the, and to the uh, facility, stability facility. So that's, that's, that's certainly what's happened. Uh, but as a consequence of those decisions, unfortunately, those public sector institutions are now exposed to losses doesn't really matter too much. If, if the asset side of a central bank's balance sheet takes a hit, does it? What, what, are, the, what are the economic consequences of that? Those assets are there yesterday. <clears throat> what, what the, you know what the British Ch Chancellor of the Exchequer is doing? He's saying, uh, oh, the Bank of England got a lot of uh, government bonds. So why don't we just cancel them? You are the government, I'm the government, we just cancelled them. Actually, <clears throat> it's very hard to say that that might come under present circumstances. There will be circumstances in which such a practice would be wildly inflationary. I don't think we're in those circumstances. I really don't. And now not, but maybe in, let's say, five, ten years, when the central bank will need to pull the money out of the system, then they will have to sell the, that <coughs> securities. And if they don't have the securities, well, that's, that's they will a hypothetical to... problem in five or ten years. And it might not even be a serious problem, it's certainly not as serious as the unemployment, current unemployment crisis, crisis of business enterprise, crisis of investment development, that, and the crisis of legitimacy. Undermining the European project at present. They have to have exit strategies, I guess. Uh, they have to be ready to tighten if, if European economy looks like overheating. It doesn't look like overheating to me. Uh, workers throughout, across the continent are still experiencing declines in their living standards. They're not in a position to demand compensation for inflation. So there won't be wage inflation. 
You only get wage inflation when workers are in a position to drive wages up. We're a long, long way from that position, even in Germany. And another one. Uh, of words and the O in the back. Um, and see you next Thursday.